This video will look at a new study from researchers at UC Berkeley showing how to best use a limited computing budget for natural language processing. This paper shows that the best strategy is to train a large model with large batches using gradient accumulation, then stop the training of this model early, subject to the compute budget, and then heavily compress it with quantization and pruning. The robustness to compression of these large models, prescribed as 30-40% to 40 weight pruning and 6-8 to 8 bit quantization, is especially appealing because it avoids the inference bottleneck that would come as a trade-off for training these large models and then storing them and running predictions through them. One reason I really like this paper is that their experiments include fine-tuning these pre-trained models into downstream tasks like sentiment classification and natural language inference, showing that their pipeline and results generalize beyond perplexity on mass language modeling objectives. This video will explore some of the findings in this really interesting paper, Train Large, Then Compress. This video will explain Train Large, Then Compress, a new study from researchers at UC Berkeley that show if you have a limited compute budget, it actually makes more sense to train a larger model and stop training before it converges than to train a smaller model. Naturally, a larger model comes with an inference bottleneck as well, since it takes longer and more memory to make predictions with these larger models. To combat this, the authors show that larger models are more robust to compression techniques like quantization and pruning, alleviating the inference trade-off with training these larger models. This video challenges some of the conventional wisdoms with training deep neural networks with empirical results that show that an opposite kind of intuition is true. The common practice would be if you have a limited compute budget to think of training a small model and then train it all the way to convergence such that the error isn't increasing or decreasing much and then lightly compress the model with things like pruning, quantization, or distillation. In this paper, they show that it's actually optimal to train a larger model and then stop training early. So rather than training this large model all the way until it converges because you have a limited compute budget, you stop training it after say five or 10, or probably a more extreme like 20 or 30 epochs, compared to training it like 200 epochs with the smaller model. And then they show that you can heavily compress these uh, large models. So say prune 40% uh, of the weights and quantize it down to six bits compared to uh, 16 or 32 bits. So by heavily compressing this model, you alleviate the inference constraint that comes with these uh, larger models. And then by stopping the training early, you overcome the limited compute budget that will prevent you from training a large model in the first place. One of the core takeaways from this study is that these large transformer models trained on this mass language modeling task or high resource machine translation, and then fine tuned on tasks like sentiment classification or natural language inference, converge faster than smaller models. So what this means is after you train it for a few steps, the deeper models in the Roberta architecture converge much, much faster than the smaller models. And this is kind of the central idea, is that instead of training this, say, purple three-layer model or this uh, pink six-layer model all the way until it converges, you can stop a deeper model at an earlier iteration of the training. So you see how the uh, bottom left of this kind of curve is has the green and the orange, the 18 and 24-layer models, in both cases of measuring it by wall clock or number of gradient steps. So the core idea is that you would stop it at say this uh, amount of training time and then the larger model is a better model than the smaller model even if you were to train that smaller model all the way until it converges with your compute budget. A question you might have about this study is how exactly to scale up your model from a small model to a large model. A lot of papers have looked at this like the efficient net model that looks at compound scaling to scale up uh, width, depth, and input resolution for scaling up the size of these models. In this paper, the authors show that this uh, performance gain and the faster convergence is largely a function of parameter count, and it's weakly influenced by architecture details like the width of the model or the depth. So particularly in this case, how many of uh, these transformer blocks do you stack on top of each other and what the hidden size of the intermediate dimension is. So in the case of the machine translation, they find that uh, scaling up the width is generally better than scaling up the depth. A similar study was found in exploring what's hidden in a randomly weighted network where they show that uh, if you increase the width of the network, it's easily, it's more easy to find these sub-networks that uh, have random weights that can perform classification tasks. One technique the authors describe for scaling up the size of the model and the size of the batches used to train these large models is the use of gradient accumulation. So the idea of gradient accumulation is a really simple idea. All you do is you uh, pass some network through a forward pass on say a subset of the batch, and then you just hold on to those gradients before you update the model. So say you run it with a batch of 64, and you want your batch size to be 256, you do this four times, saving up all the gradients, and then you would do this batch update with all the gradients that you've accumulated, and then continue training doing this. So doing gradient accumulation is one way to save this kind of uh, memory bottleneck with respect, or a uh, compute bottleneck with respect to parallelizing 
this massive amount of batches on this network. These plots show the results of their study using gradient accumulation to scale up the size of the batches in order to train these larger models with larger batches. In their study, they find a critical region between 2048 and 16,384, in which case they don't find that you uh, get much improvement by further increasing the size of the batch. So it's interesting to see the performance gain achieved by training with these larger batch sizes and how having a larger batch, you see again the bottom left of this curve, which is the general theme of this paper, you see that with the larger batches like 8,192 or 16,384, you have this bottom left plot of the curve where it's converging quickly. So if you want to only do uh, 20,000 gradient steps, you would rather do it with the larger batch size than the smaller batch size trained for 80,000 gradient steps. One reason why this is a really great paper is they test the full end-to-end -end natural language processing pipeline that's commonly used for downstream applications. So usually what you do is you pre-train these models like Roberta on mass language modeling on massive text corpora. Like in this case, they use 3.4 billion words from Books Corpus and Wikipedia. And then you transfer that knowledge into a downstream task like sentiment classification or natural language inference. So you take these representations learned by predicting the mass tokens on a massive data set in this mass language modeling task and then you transfer it into these applications that you want to do, like classifying the sentiment of tweets or seeing if the uh, kind of logic of a paragraph makes sense by predicting entailment, neutral, or contradiction between uh, these two different sentences or paragraphs. So these kind of applications is this general framework of natural language processing where you pre-train these massive language models, then you fine-tune them on task. So what they're going to further show in their study, train large, then compress, is that these larger models aren't harder to fine-tune on these downstream tasks and smaller models because you might expect that you know training these larger models and then switching the weights into some new task or some new data distribution is going to be harder to fine tune than a smaller model but they actually show that this isn't the case this table illustrates that larger models aren't harder to fine tune than smaller models given the same compute budget and this is interesting because the smaller models like the 12 layer with the 768 dimension uh, hidden state compared to a 24 layer transformer is able to get in much more forward and backward passes to fine tune on this new data distribution of natural language inference or sentiment classification. So this shows that with the same compute budget, the larger models are able to achieve the same, if not a little higher performance than the smaller models. And this is also really interesting because the larger models, you know, they, they have more potential as if you were to train it for a longer compute time. So if you're thinking about a setting where uh, you're doing mass language modeling and then you wanna transfer this into several tasks, it's obviously more advantageous to do this approach because you can quickly fine tune it on many tasks. And if you were to take one task and try to achieve like a really high performance, you just train it for longer. The next major focus of this paper is the inference bottleneck of large models. So now that you've trained your large model, it takes longer to make predictions and it takes more memory because you have a larger model compared to the smaller one and it takes more time to run all this computation to go forward through it and you need more memory to store all the parameters in this network. Further in this study, they're gonna show that you can heavily compress these models with quantization and pruning to make up for this inference bottleneck of large models. In order to address the inference troubles with large models, the authors turned to quantization and pruning, rather than another technique for model compression known as knowledge distillation. In knowledge distillation, you have a lower capacity student network that mimics the information in the higher capacity network by being trained to output the uh, same class distribution as the teacher network. But they avoid using distillation in this paper because that process of distilling the knowledge into the student network is very computationally heavy and they're particularly optimizing to get the best performance out of a transformer language model with a limited compute budget in this paper. So for this reason they turn to quantization and pruning. Quantization is this idea of instead of uh, representing the weights with 32 bits you'll scale that down to something like 8, 6, or 4. And this is also really advantageous because these uh, like uh, hardware they're particularly optimized for this lower precision kind of multiplication. So when you have like an 8-bit or a 4-bit uh, number, it takes advantage of these tensor cores and the NVIDIA GPUs more so than a 16-bit or a 32-bit uh, you know, value would. So the idea behind quantization is to scale these weights down such that you can represent the full scale with these, this amount of bits. So it doesn't mean, uh, say, if you're doing 4-bit quantization, it doesn't mean every weight is either like uh, 0 or 16 but it means that you have this uh, clever algorithm of scaling the weights into this kind of uh, range that can be represented with that amount of precision. The idea of pruning is a lot simpler than quantization. All you do is you just zero out the smallest magnitude parameters and then maybe train it for like one epoch or half an epoch to recover that accuracy of losing those uh, weights that have just been masked out. So they find the best performance is achieved by pruning 30 to 40% of the weights and then quantizing it down to six or eight bits. 
This plot illustrates that these larger transformer Roberta models are more robust to these compression techniques of quantization and pruning, also in the case of having a higher hidden dimension as well as more layers, showing generally this trend that it's about the parameter count and weakly dependent on the actual width and depth of the network. So it's mostly a function of the parameter count as illustrated by the chart. So you see this chart shows that as you quantize it, the uh, higher capacity models, they don't degrade as quickly as the uh, lower ones do with respect to the memory. And again, if you, you know, slice this at any X point of memory usage or number of parameters, you see that the, on the top of it with respect to accuracy is going to be the larger model. It's further showing this trend that, you know, train large and then compress. These larger models are more robust to compression than the smaller models are. So if you train a large model, then you compress it with quantization and pruning, you end up with a model that had the same uh, memory or compute requirements as if you had just trained a smaller model to fit your compute budget, but you get a higher performance by doing this pipeline of training a large model and then compressing it. This plot further shows the trend that if you stack quantization and pruning, and then you slice it at any X constraint of the parameter count, you get a higher value for larger models. And this can be, this plot can be a little tough to read because it isn't like uh, sequentially the higher model. You see the top performing model is this light green 24 layer model. And then the gray one kind of predicted at the bottom of this uh, plot, sort of indicating that it's the largest model is actually uh, the gray model somewhere in the middle. So it's a bit of confusing. It would probably be a little better just have a single color scale. But you see this trend that the 24 layer model with a 768 dimension hidden state, no matter what you uh, reduce the parameter count to, remains on the top of all the different models with respect to the validation accuracy on the fine tuned task of natural language inference. This plot further shows the result that you have a smaller compression error for larger models. So this idea of train large and then compress is showing that larger models are more robust to these compression techniques like quantization and pruning than smaller models are. You see the variance in performance is much higher for the six layer model when it's compressed compared to the 24 layer or the 12 layer. And that's further shown across these different kinds of ways of where exactly in the transformer model you prune and compress and quantize the weights. So compared to doing it in the uh, self-attention projection, which is where you have the uh, these matrices that transform the uh, original input into the query key and value matrices, or the actual out projection where uh, you do that uh, key value transformation and then you project that out into a feed forward layer. Overall, just looking at this transformer architecture, if you really want to get into exactly how the self-attention layer is structured and where exactly you're going to do this uh, quantization or pruning within the model. One interesting characteristic of this study is they're doing mass language modeling on a massive data set of 3.4 billion words. And generally with this mass language modeling or the autoregressive pre-training tasks, these models don't overfit to this data because it's a massive amount of data and you would need an enormous amount of parameters. Even the latest Turing NLG with 17 billion or the Megatron LM with 8 billion, they don't overfit to that pre-training data. So what they show in this plot is that if you scale down the amount of data, so say you only have 5% or 1% of their pre-training uh, data set, then this trend actually doesn't hold as well. So it's kind of showing that, you know, there's a relationship between the size of the data and then doing this train large, then compress pipeline, because, you know, we have so much data right now that the idea of training large is beneficial because you can't quite fit to that data anyways. So it makes sense to try to get as close as you can to it and then stop the convergence compared to a smaller model. So this plot shows the results of if you have less data and sort of how this uh, scaling up of the neural language models changes with respect to the data set size. Another interesting section of this paper is connecting these results with the lottery ticket hypothesis. The lottery ticket hypothesis states that within these large deep neural networks, you can find sub networks that perform as well as the entire network if you were to mask out all the other weights and only run the predictions through these sub networks. So the connection is that these larger transformer models have more of these sub networks that have the right initialization to be trained well. So as you scale it up, you're more likely to find these sub networks. And that's kind of an explanation for why it's so robust to things like the weight pruning or the quantization, because you have these sub networks that exist within the larger transformer models that perform uh, as well as the entire network would. Thanks for watching this explanation of train large, then compress. The authors show the best way to use a limited compute budget for training transformer language models on the pre-training objective of mass language modeling and then fine-tuning them for downstream tasks such as natural language inference or sentiment classification is best done by training a large model, stopping training early, and then heavily compressing it with quantization or pruning. This is despite the conventional wisdom that with your limited compute budget, you should just train a smaller model and then train it all the way to convergence and then lightly compress that model. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.